Hey everybody, welcome to Drive Through View 614. Today we're going to take a look at the Expanse board game. Now this is just coming out now from WizKids, uh, designed by Jeff Engelstein, who has done other games like Space Cadets and Ares Project and Space Cadets Dice Duel and a whole bunch of other games. Uh, this is based on the television show, The Expanse, even though that's a series of books, all of the art and things in here are drawn out of the television show. And as far as I can tell, the plot, which is sort of very loosely adhered to, it's not really thick with plot, although I won't say it's necessarily, doesn't have theme, we'll get to that in the review part, but it seems to be mostly driven by the television show. Now what this is, is a two to four player game, and mechanically it's an area control game. You're trying to have influence in these different sort of planetary regions, you have know, ships that you kind of fly around that help you with that, and there's a little bit of kind of combat and stuff. Uh, but basically on your turn, he's doing something very interesting and unique that's a little bit derived from Twilight Struggle, if you've played that, or the Coin series of games, which is also published by GMT Games, along with Twilight Struggle, uh, where you kind of choose cards and you either do them for the action points or you do it for like the cool event. But you have to kind of choose and make up your mind which is better, but you might also trigger the event for your opponents. So that's kind of the crux of the mechanisms. Let's jump into how it works and then I will give you my thoughts. Okay, so I've got the board here seated for a four player game. It does play two to four players. I've got all four factions in play. As you can see, you've got this initiative track here. OPA, Mars, Protogen, and the United Nations, or Earth. And this is just kind of randomly uh, done as a turn order. So United Nations is randomly going first. So they're gonna be last in the initiative track. And then we're gonna work our way up. And so OPA is going last, but they have the nice opportunity of being first in the initiative. Now, the other thing that's gonna happen is the player that's going last is gonna be awarded here, this card here. And this is the Rosinante. So if you're familiar with the show, these are kind of the main characters of the show. So this ship here, which is now out here in Tycho, you can see that little yellow marker there. It's gonna start with the OPA there. And then it's going to sort of bounce between factions. This is sort of a neutral thing. It gives you some special abilities that you can do during scoring, but just know for now that the OPA has it. And so the OPA has also their own little player card. It tells you kind of what you can do on your turn, a little special abilities that you can do. And then it also gives you how to sort of set up at the start of the game and all the stuff that you have. Now I have all the pieces over here and I'm sorry for the glare on the cards, but I'll fix that in a minute. I couldn't get any position where those weren't glary. Uh, so you have your little influence tokens there for the different factions of the different colors, a couple other little tokens that are special and unique to you that you're going to unlock as you move through the game. So each player also gets three of these special technology cards. Uh, they're all different except for the level two, which is the same across everybody. But as you go through scoring rounds, you're going to reveal these. So we're always going to reveal the level one technology. And then the second scoring will trigger the level two and then finally the level three. So those will give you some different ways to play and different cool bonuses and things that you can do. So that's everything the players get. And what you're trying to do is have influence in these different regions. You can kind of see here the map is broken up in a few different ways. You have all of these different boxes here. And just think of these as sort of land or planetary locations like Earth has these three boxes, Mars has two, whereas Eros and Thoth each have just, just, just one there. But if we zoom in a little bit there, we can see there's orbitals around these. So here we have the Eros orbital around the Eros planet. And these are where the ships are gonna go. The influence is gonna go in the boxes and the ships are gonna go kind of adjacent to that. If we bump over here to Mars, we can see this orbital here influences both of these boxes. And like I said, Earth up there has uh, one big orbital for all three of the little influence boxes. Now the other thing to note about how the board is broken up is we have inner planets, the belt, and the outer planets. So these are the three sort of regions that you're gonna score. So you're gonna score these differently kind of based on what the actions of the players choose and everything. The final way that the board is sort of broken up are these bands. So you can see you have this thick band here separating the inner planets from the outer planets, or the belt, excuse me. And then you have another band here separating the belt from this left outer planets area and then another thick band here in terms of separating this. So basically you're separating Jupiter and Saturn just kind of to represent the distances of the planets there. So that's important because when you move ships, just move this over a little bit, you can go to any ship spot or any orbital in that band. So I can move a ship from a Thoth to anything in here or one band away. So I can go to a anything in this band over here or this band, but I can't 
for example, go from Thoth all the way to Saturn. I've got to get to Jupiter and then Saturn. So it's a little bit trickier to get out to Saturn and there's a lot of good juicy influence out here uh, to get at. Or a lot of spot where influence can be focused, I should say. So that's how the board is broken up. Now you're gonna play over the course of several rounds. It's not a fixed turn type of thing. You're gonna go through here this deck of glary cards until you get to six scoring cards. So these scoring cards are gonna be shuffled in here. And then once the sixth is revealed, that's gonna trigger the end of the game. And then you'll do kind of a final scoring. Now the crux of the game is choosing these cards and then either doing action points or an event. So let's take a closer look at one of these cards that doesn't have glare on it. So let's say it came to my turn and that this was one of the cards I wanted to choose. There's two things I'm looking at. One is the action points, and you can choose the card and use it for the action points and spend that to place influence, move ships, all kinds of other things. Some of your special abilities will take action points that you can do and spend, or you can do the event. Now you can only do the event if you're one of the depicted factions here. So only the UN or the OPA can do this. But let's say I'm Mars and I really want to do four action points. I'm going to choose that. And then anybody, if I chose the action points, anybody that's shown here kind of on the eligible track here will then get an opportunity to choose and do the event after I'm done doing my actions. You can say, okay, well, there's two factions here, OPA and UN. Who gets the first choice? Well, in this case, the OPA is going to get the first choice because they have the initiative. Now, if they choose not to do it, it's going to drop all the way down to UN, who again was the next eligible faction depicted on the card. But let's say OPA decided to choose it and then they can choose to execute the event. And what they're going to do is drop down to the bottom of the initiative, no matter where they're at on here. If they choose to sort of uh, react by playing the event. If another player chose the action points, they're going to drop down. So they're going to be kind of last in terms of choosing to piggyback off a card like that from now on. Now, the other thing to note about these events is uh, if you chose it as your turn, let's say you were the UN or the OPA in this case, and you chose to just do the event, uh, you can, instead of actually doing the event now, you can pay and keep it. Or if somebody else did it, like say Mars did the action points in our previous example, and then the OPA, instead of doing it now as a reaction, they can pay and keep it. Now they're still gonna drop down here because they've interacted with it. Now, what are you paying? Well, you're paying the CP, which are actually your victory points. And everybody's gonna start at 10. And let's say OPA decided, you know what, I'm gonna pay and I'm gonna keep that. So I'm gonna pay a victory point there, and then I'm gonna keep this in front of me. And now, when I have this in front of me, I have a couple of options. I can now, instead of choosing a card, uh, just play this as the event on my turn. So you can keep this when it's, you know, you're like, oh, this is a really good event, but it's not gonna do a whole lot, but hey, two, three, five, six, seven turns down the road, this is gonna be really good. And I can kind of lord this over people as well. And now I'm gonna trigger the event instead of choosing a card and do that. The other thing is everybody gets a chance to possibly execute these events that are in front of them and that they've kept from earlier when we do scoring, which I'll explain. So a lot of times you wanna keep an event or two around to affect kind of just that last second thing right before we do scoring. Now, the other thing to note about how you choose these cards, you can see these numbers are zero, one, one, and we go down here and we've got two and two. The cards up here are free to do. You don't have to pay any extra points, but if I wanted to choose a card that's further along the track, again, I've gotta pay my victory points and lose some CP there. Now you notice this little UN symbol here, that's one of their special abilities is they can choose from these two slots, both of them are free for them. So what are some of the things you can do with action points? Now if we choose a card and use it for its action points, there's a few things that we can do. We can move a group of fleets. So let's say we have these two up here, and Tycho, we want to move them down here to Arrow. So we can take a group and move it, and that's an action point to do that. Next thing we can do is if we have fleets in an orbital, we can then put influence. So we can do one influence there. So that's two action points. We spent and moved the fleets, and one action point to put an influence out. Now we can build in a, our kind of our home area. So uh, let's let's say uh, these guys have moved it down and they had a fleet destroyed or something. This is kind of their home, Tycho. So for one action point, they could build a fleet that was previously destroyed. You start with all your fleets on the board to begin the game. Now you also will get uh, special abilities and things that also cost you action points. It'll tell you how much uh, to do that. And sometimes cards will kind of 
tinker with the amount of action points available. Uh, but that's just kind of the basic stuff you're going to do. Be putting influence out, moving ships around, and then eventually destroying ships for action points as the kind of war escalates over the course of the game. And really, that's all these events are really going to do. They're just going to be kind of spruced up fancy ways of moving influence and ships and stuff like that and putting them, uh, you know, in places where you want them to be. Because again, you're trying to have kind of the most influence in all of the locations or as many locations as you have. And the one thing to note is you are limited. So for example, these are all the OPA's influence. This is all they got. And once they're out there and if you have to manipulate them, then you can pull them off and shift them around. But you're limited to this. And you're also limited to the amount of ship markers because resources are very, very tight. So you're going to play a couple of rounds. People are going to choose cards and do events and actions. Then you're going to see a scoring card appear in that row. And it, once it appears, it just sits there like anything else. Uh, let's say it pops up and Mars is really interested in scoring at this point. So they're going to spend uh, maybe two action point or two CP, I should say, to choose that scoring card. And that's going to trigger scoring. If he doesn't choose it, it's just going to slowly move down the row until somebody chooses it. And then we score. Now, the first thing you're going to do when you score is choose a region for bonus scoring. So again, we have inner planets, the belt and outer planets, and we have markers for those here. We have two each. So let's just pretend, let's see what would Mars do. Well, Mars would probably not want to choose scoring at this point, but let's just be silly and we'll choose the outer planets. So they're going to take and choose this. They're going to put this face down up here on the scoring track and put the rest of these here face down off to the side. Now Mars has chosen that. We can see now they've selected this bonus sector to get a little bump in the points that are scored for having the most influence. All the rest of these regions are gonna score very piddly points. You're only gonna get one point for having the most influence in a region, whereas you get two for the most and then one for second place. And you can see as the scoring cards are come out, this is gonna increase and increase. So the scoring is gonna be a little bit more dramatic as the game progresses until the final scoring, at which point, again, this is gonna happen as soon as the sixth card appears. So even if the fourth and fifth card are sitting in the scoring row, as soon as that sixth card appears, you're gonna skip those scorings. And I've seen a game where we have three scorings and then we just are all camping on these other scoring cards and then that sixth one comes out and then bam, the game's over. So I've also seen all of these fill up as well. Um, but it, the final scoring, you're gonna score all three of the different regions as a 5-3-1 for second, third place uh, scoring. So after, in this case, let's say Mars chose the bonus sector, then everybody gets to play one of those kept events. So if you had an event kept, you could play that at this point. And that's starting with the player to the left of Mars. So Mars in this case chose it, and then whoever, UN, UOPA, they all get to do one kept event. And if you have the Rosinante card here, instead of that, you can do one of these four possible actions. And these are pretty decent actions here. Uh, and you, you, if you have this, you don't really need to worry about keeping an event because you know you're gonna be able to do something uh one of these four types of things here and what's going to happen is after we score whoever has the least amount of points in the victory point track is going to get this and i should have mentioned here i don't know if i mentioned it before but you also get control of this ship so it's like having a extra bonus ship as well in your fleet that you can do things with and this one can never be destroyed and just for an example we'll take a look at a little area here and see how it's actually scored so let's say this was a a bonus sector. Otherwise, the winner is just going to get one point. But in this case, we're doing the first scoring and we selected here outer planets. So in this case, Mars is going to get two points for that one. They're also going to get two points for this one because you can see, okay, well, you say they're tied. They each have two. But whoever has the largest fleet in the whole area is going to add plus one influence to anywhere that they already have influence. So Mars has these cool special ships here, these battleships, they count as two. When you take an event or action that will allow you to destroy it, instead of actually being removed off the board, these will actually just get turned over and they go down to uh, kind of just counting as one ship. If you hit them again, then they'll go away. But when they rebuild them back at Mars, they come in two as strong as a two. Uh, so in this case, Mars has three total ships. And so they actually have two influence here and three influence here. So they're breaking that tie there. And so Mars would get two for that, two for that. White would get one for that and then blue here would get two for this one and white would get one. And there's some other cool things like the UN will get these big cubes, they get three of those, those counts as two. Uh, OPA gets these little half banger ships here, 
Those are good for breaking ties and messing with Mars. Um, but the black team here, the Protogen Corp, can like go ahead and nuke one of these where they nuke everything, and then uh, they get to put one of theirs out. They only have two of those, and they get these later on. And then you get some other special abilities that you can you can deal with. Uh, so after you score all of that, again, everybody's going to take and flip over their next uh, special uh, technology card. In this case, so we get level one. And like I said, this is you win all orbital control ties you are involved with. So that's their ability, that the first one that they get from Mars. And then after that, everybody gets to build one fleet for free. So if you had a fleet destroyed, you get to put one out for free. And then, again, whoever has the least amount of points will get control of the Rosinante. Again, they control the ship on the board as well. And you keep playing until uh, that six scoring card comes up. And that's the game. Okay, so that is the Expanse. What do I think of it? Well, let's first talk about player count. Now, I've played as two players once and four players four times. Uh, like it the best with four. I haven't played with three, but there you go. Four player, there's just enough going on and enough sort of um, purpose and interest from all four players to sort of diffuse and sort of make the, the board state way more interesting than you do with two players. With two players, you have one player with the UN or Earth and the other player is Mars, and then you take over those initiative tokens and sort of block out a couple of the uh, areas where you put influence to kind of shrink the board a little bit. And then you take out some cards and things like that. The cards are marked in a certain way. Um, and then it's it's still fun with two players. It's still like a back and forth kind of thing. It feels a little bit like you're playing uh, Twilight Struggle, but a really tight Twilight Struggle. Because like I said, you've only got this very few influence tokens, very few ships. So you're not really going to be going everywhere. You're going to really have to focus your efforts in one of the three regions. And of course, try to get that scoring card to get the bonus scoring so you can really sort of compound those points. Um, the one thing the two player kind of lacks that the four player has is you can sort of piggyback and sort of get those second place points a little bit better and then maybe throwing more of your influence uh, over to another spot to then to get the next scoring card that's going to be worth even more points. So yeah, I didn't get the scoring card and it was two and one point, but I got the next one and now it's three and one point. And so I, I'm going to catch back up a little bit. So just the way that the board state and everything works like that in a multiplayer game is more fun. And it's just a, this does a lot of really cool things too. So I've alluded to at the beginning and during the walkthrough a little bit, it's like Twilight Struggle, where you have the action point versus the event thing. And it's also like the coin series where you have who's kind of eligible for the event. That kind of takes that a little bit from the coin series. But it trickles out like a row of cards, if you think of like Through the Ages or something, where you can pick and you can go down there, but you gotta spend your victory points to get at that really juicy four action point card or the really cool event or that scoring card that you want. So you have to kind of balance that in terms of, okay, if I spend two points now, well, if I score now, I'm gonna get, you know, plus eight over everybody or something, not that much usually, but you know, you get a little bit more. So it's worth it for me to spend the two points to get more of a lead or get this really cool event. Uh, the keeping of the event is really neat. That's a nice twist because a lot of times you have this card, you're like, this card's awesome, but nobody's in this region. So this card's gonna affect that region. It's not gonna do anything. I'm gonna keep it. And now everybody knows I have it, so I can kind of lord it over them, or I can you know play it right at the last minute with scoring. And that's a really cool kind of twist. I feel like that's a, a, a little bit of it, one of one of the many innovations kind of on this sort of style here. Uh, the way the game kind of shakes out um, after I play it with people that have played it more than once is it becomes very much like Tammany Hall if you've played that. So it becomes very sort of cutthroat and you get kind of alliances and stuff like that where like, ah, you know, Joel's probably gonna lock this thing up. So we're all gonna dogpile on him and you and I are in first or second place already, but he's gonna pass us by a whole bunch. We'll lock it in and then we'll deal with each other later. <laughs> uh, so you can have a lot of those elements, which I like, uh, that are very similar, similar to Tammany Hall type of thing. Now it's not quite as tight and cutthroat and just, um, I don't know, you don't have a lot of those like game ending like, oh, I'm not gonna win now, <laughs> like you do in T Tammany Hall, where this is like, okay, I'm not gonna do great, but I, if I can get back in shape, you know, I can, I can do okay. It's not quite that way. And the one thing that has soured people about this is the way that the scoring cards come up, um, be, especially in a two player game, because you could just be in a position where, okay, we just got done scoring this fourth scoring card, and then, you know, you're good, 
We scored the outer belts twice as bonuses. You're focusing on the on the uh, on the inner um, the inner planets, and then you score it. Oh, and then another one comes up, and you you did really well, but nobody had a chance to really react and you know do anything about your foothold that you've gotten. So the other scoring card came up because they're kind of randomly sort of spaced out through the deck, and then you can kind of double down on that, and that feels less fair. Now in a four player game, you know you're not going to be able to go. You're going to get multiple turns in. Uh, to sort of affect that. Uh, and even in a two-player game, it's still tighter because you're not having to deal with all these balls in the air. So if you let yourself get in that position, that's kind of just a bad play. You have to get better. But it still has that possibility that you can get in that situation. And I had seen something like that where, actually in the last scoring card, it was the fifth scoring card, and it was like he was ahead, he was ahead, and then I was ahead, and then he caught up and we were tied. And then in the last scoring card, it was like, oh, now he's winning by two. And then the sixth one flopped. And then it was like, well, okay. And then he's winning by two again. Um, just because the game state was such in that he was just a little bit ahead of me in a couple of places. And so there's, there was nothing I could do about it with that last minute scoring card. I hope I explained that clearly. <laughs> but yeah, that can be kind of a feel bad kind of thing where that scoring card just comes up and just triggers. But I don't mean... Yeah, it just depends how serious you take winning the game, in my opinion. Like, I'm fine with that. It's just, it's part of the excitement because what happens with the game is you have this buildup of, and it's a narrative thing, but it's all just very abstract mechanical thing where you're like, okay, first bonus round, we're getting two points. And then by the end, it's like three and four and then five at the end of the game. And the scoring shifting because as you choose the different sectors to get bonuses, you can only choose each sector twice. Uh, so if you chose interplant, interplant at the beginning, okay, good for you. You got the bonuses from the two and three point. Congratulations. Now we're going to score four and five points or whatever towards the end of the game on these others that you can choose. So the scoring dynamics will shift over the course of the game. And that's just going to push tensions around the table. And then you're going to have these events that you keep. And that just becomes kind of an arms race. Like, oh, you kept an event? I'll keep an event. I'll keep an event. I'll keep an event. And it's because you know when you score, you get that last little little push that you can swing something in a key area right as you score and that's really cool so that also kind of counteracts the scoring flop but again you can still get in a situation where it's like scoring scoring uh i chose twice you know i think that's still part of the game that's part of that tension built into uh just a little bit of the logistics and the chaos of you know managing a space company or uh political government kind of thing i really like this game uh the components are not good. I, I don't mind the uh, stills of the characters on the show. I, I don't like a lot of people don't like that when they use stills from a movie and stuff. I like it. I don't know. It seems fine. It kind of puts me in the theme of it. But the board and everything's super abstract. The components are just little cubes and little tiny spaceships and stuff. And it's very like just functional, which is fine. But I don't know. I just it doesn't. It's not. It doesn't look good at all. But whatever. It doesn't bother me when I'm playing the game. I'm so engrossed in the game that I don't really care what it looks like. I'm more talking to the players and arguing and uh, you know gnashing of teeth. I don't really care what the board looks like when that's going on. So that's the Expanse. Definitely high recommendation for me. A lot of fun. Definitely best at four players. And if you like this kind of cutthroat area control, a little bit of negotiation and sort of uh, a little bit deal making and that kind of stuff. Um, then I definitely recommend this one. Thanks.